Hello beautiful community, we're going to do a slow blitz. I predict we'll be here 15 minutes and the questions that have come in repeatedly are Why such a big emphasis you're making Vlad on the non-combatant combatant distinction? Is there a solution to Israeli-Palestinian conflict? If so, what is it? What's the connection between the Israeli resistance movement to the Netanyahu authoritarianism and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? Um, how should we react to the siege of Gaza? What about the worst pro-Hamas takes, how to react to those and making connections with Ukraine? Now, firstly, we'll start with a question that I've already answered on, on Twitter, actually. And that is, you said you can't say in two minutes flat what um, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is. It's past, it's present. And if you can, that means you have a good enough view of it. But what about the Ukraine, the Russo-Ukrainian war? Can you summarize that in two minutes? But, and my answer to that is yeah, actually yes. And briefly, I've forgotten what I said on Twitter, but roughly it's that there is an empire that has got nothing to offer the world except violence, that's invaded a country that wants to be free, motivated by its own conception of regime security and its aspiration for a mystically or quasi-mystically motivated rearrangement of the international order and international disorder, whatever you choose to call it. That'll do. So you kind of can. Um, why did you choose to emphasize so much the combatant, non-combatant distinction? And so many questions have come in about this, including this one um, from a Catholic priest um, who is um, a beautiful uh, part of the beautiful community here. And some of what you say is, I use your channel to look at human affairs from a different angle. I've already learned that objective distinctions may um, hinder us to act politically well. So, and here, of course, we come to this combatant, non-combatant distinction. This will not be a long lecture today at all. Now, it's not that we take political distinctions unobjectively, we pull them out of the sky, is that rather we take them non-theoretically or non-analytically. So they are objective. And what they are are objective responses to what are the most urgent problems we face. And the question is, is this distinction helping us or stopping us from facing up to some of the most urgent challenges we face? And that's how you're going to define terms like genocide or um, ethnic cleansing or human rights. So you ask this question now about the competent, non-competent distinction. In the democracy where everybody is kind of a ruler, isn't an everybody a combatant um, in some sense. And of course, the answer here is um, no. And I know that you don't think that the answer is yes, you're just speculating. But the answer is no, except in the sense that all citizens are responsible for what their state does. But that responsibility is certainly not guilt, right? Um, you know, people we've just seen um, massacred in the most disgraceful way in Israel um, aren't guilty. They're responsible for the Israeli-Palestinian conflict being in the state that it's in. They're not guilty. They just got massacred without being guilty. The distinction between combatants and non-combatants is useful if the fighting forces want to keep their families safe. But for tactical reasons, sometimes leaders may choose differently and troops may indeed fight more valiantly if it's their last resort. Is there any ethical reason other than safety why you take that um, distinction so seriously? Yes. As many of the greatest political thinkers across the history of the West have taught us, the main thing the state does is bring, brings it about that people don't kill each other, brings about that there is order, 
by gaining a monopoly over organized violence. And this is a deep analysis. Sounds like a two-year-old has come up with it. This is a deep analysis. And a great political thinker like Thomas Hobbes, once you abstract away things that are contingent elements of his view, actually gives a completely modern account of what the state is for. Now, when two states fight, it's the human instantiations of this monopoly of organized violence that are fighting. Not everybody who lives in these states. Second remark. The most unregulated sphere of human conflict is interstate conflict. This is the sphere where the biggest amount of catastrophe, the biggest amount of destruction of human life occurs. So we want to do everything we possibly can to reduce the amount of devastation that happens in interstate activities. Human destructiveness is least controlled in its expression in conflict between states. And we have a history of extraordinary loss of civilian life, right? In the First World War, one in six, one in seven deaths were civilian deaths. It was one in two in the Second World War. Third remark. We are never going to agree on what is a just or an unjust reason to go to war. Look at the senseless war of Mr. Putin. He believes in it. He's not making it up. He believes this is a defensive war against the West. So our prospects of agreeing 200, 500 years from now on what is and what is not a just conflict are zero. As we're not going to make any progress, we need some approaches that help us to minimize the destruction of human life, allowing for the fact that we're not going to agree on um, what's a justified and what's an unjustified war. And one way to go here is to um, try really hard to detach our understanding of what it is and what it isn't okay to do to civilians. If you are a terrorist or a freedom fighter, whatever one's interpretation, right, of a particular event, we want to say something that is pretty similar in both cases about how much civilian life you're allowed to take. More later. I suppose I'll say something extra on this question for the benefit of the, of the audience in general. And it's this. Our understanding of collateral damage is conceptually insupportable, right? And that's because we tend to distinguish between intentional killing on the one hand, which is the kind of stuff in its worst kind we've seen from Hamas, but we tend to distinguish between intentional killing on the one hand and on the other hand everything else. But much of the time the distinction that crucially matters is between a state actor that isn't trying to kill civilians but on the other hand isn't trying to not kill them either right? and a state actor that is intentionally trying to minimize civilian casualties. And we put both of these under the tab of collateral damage, but there's a world of difference between them. Right? And so um, sometimes certain practices need to come under different concepts um, as we begin to understand them better. Let's take an example. Imagine, for those of you who are older, you may have encountered corporal punishment in schools, right? And if it's 1950, we might associate the practice of co uh, corporate punishment with mm, discipline, education, pupil improvement. In 2023, we're more likely to put 
a situation where a teacher is beating a student with a with a cane or with a whip or with a ruler or just slapping them. Um, they're more likely to put such a practice under the concept of assault or abuse or transgression of boundaries, right? Same practice, but we're now putting it under different concepts. And so I'm saying that the practice of bombing um, places where you're going to kill a lot of civilians um, should no longer, in many cases, come under the concept collateral damage. And as we need to explore other conceptual descriptions that bring um, the scenario um, uh, for us by illuminating that there's um, such an obvious semi-direct byproduct, direct byproduct indeed of this activity, which is going to be the death of many people, that we want to say that this is a kind of a, a form of killing. It's an indirect form of killing, but it's a form of killing rather than collateral damage. Um, and honesty about this is really important. And we'll talk about that. We'll, we'll talk about the um, not, you know, the, the, the lack of fitness for purpose of the concept of collateral damage in general. Next question. Is the solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict possible? And if so, would it be a two-state solution? Yes, it would be a two-state solution in the sense that a one-state solution is conceivable 500 years from now, but in anything like a medium-term future, it would just be a recipe for civil war and apartheid. So that's not going to work. Now, the trouble we've got is that there is no adequate political agency on either side, either the Israeli or the Palestinians. There are lots of people who know what's up on both sides and who are motivated to work um, for peace. You can't get a just solution in this country. You can't get a solution where both parties feel it's just. That's, that's, that's incoherent. Um, so there is a tragic element indeed to this conflict that is not going to be resolved by some kind of rationalization. Um, but mm, you have plenty of people like that, right? But you don't have political forces and political agency that are um, acting in a constructive way. So there is no politically tangible will for a solution really anywhere. Um, and that means that the chances of a solution are not zero. And sort of being optimists, we might say, well, the Middle East is a sort of a limitlessly unpredictable place historically. But while it's not zero, it's certainly not 10%. It's much lower than that. Um, in fact, there's just no visible mechanism for a solution at the moment, which means that we need to turn to external mechanisms for a solution. But we don't see those either. But perhaps they're more likely, but they, they would be a kind of left field event, a kind of surprise. So that's to say that if there is to be a solution, it needs to be a two-state solution. That makes sense. Um, but there is no prospect of it. Um, there is no plausible account of political agency which tells us that we're even infinitesimally moving in that direction. Um, how should we react to the siege of Gaza? Oh, no. Um, what is the connection between the Israeli resistance to the attack on the judiciary by the um, Netanyahu regime and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? So I think the most... Um, um, desolate Palestinian positions, which I w don't share, would say, you know, come on, we've got mm, military occupation, we have got colonial rule, we have got apartheid that this Israel is practicing outside the green line. And therefore, this whole project um, of the state of Israel is no good, it can't bring any good, it's not worth fighting these differences, more or less democracy in Israel, what the hell, the hell with it all, it's all rotten. And that's for me a depoliticized position. It's not a position that I accept. Um, um, Israel's democracy is real, 
Israel's democracy is extremely precious. Israel's democracy in the Israeli context and in the global context and in the Palestinian context is eminently uh, worth preserving. It's desperate that it is preserved because Israel is running fast in the direction of Poland and then Hungary at the moment. And that ain't pretty for anybody and it's especially not going to be pretty for the Israeli Arabs. Right? They're going to be um, further victimized and deprioritized, right? if this uh, essential counter-majoritarian check disappears that Netanyahu wants to remove. So, no, Israel's democracy is real, Israel's democracy is precious, Israel's democracy is worth preserving. Israel is also not behaving in a democratic way outside the Green Line, and um, the progressive Israelis that um, I would agree with, um, and whose views I recommend, would say that these three elements of um, military occupation, colonial rule, and apartheid are um, present in various interconnected ways, and that needs to be recognized. But it's both. It's both, right? So we have a precious democratic picture worth fighting for and a ghastly undemocratic picture um, in the um, you know, colony that is contiguously positioned vis-a-vis -vis Israel. What should we, how should we react to the siege of Gaza? Well, ethically what I recommend you do is reflect on that distinction between not trying to kill civilians, or, uh, merely not trying to kill civilians, but also um, not um, not uh, so the distinction is between not trying to kill civilians, uh, but not trying to not kill them, right? And positively intending, positively trying to minimize civilian casualties. That's that's a very important distinction. It's a distinction we shouldn't lose, right? And it's a distinction that has to remain strong no matter what the just cause is, right? Israel has some reason to respond now, right? It's, it's different to a scenario where Russia is starting a deranged, um, unprovoked uh, imperial uh, um, brutality, right? Um, but the justness of the cause doesn't matter. The distinction has to remain quite strongly in place. Whether you're an evildoer starting an unacceptable war, or whether you're prosecuting a just war or a just military operation. Um, so that distinction is going to be very important. Now... Um, as a moral and political philosopher, do I think that the historic siege of Gaza is um, acceptable um, in um, human and, and ethical and indeed political terms? No, I do not. Um, many Israelis recognize that. Do I think that it was productive from the point of view of Israel's security? No, I do not. No, I do not. So, now, what about horrible takes that are pro-Hamas? How do we balance all of this? Okay. So I've got a horrendous take here. But l let me first of all read um, from a piece by uh, Ruth Margalit, the daughter of Avishai Margalit in New York, she's based in Israel, and um, she's written a, an account of um, the massacre at the music festival. Um, and really, there were kids there saying that um, Hamas was executing people within the range of a meter or two. Um, so, again, we've just grounded ourselves ethically a bit on Gaza, let's ground ourselves a bit on Hamas. Um, you can go far, you can go far, if you think that this is a, uh, these are liberatory actions, very far preferably. Um, what Hamas did is unspeakable evil. It was shooting at some of the kids for instance, at the music festival was saying, we we're being shot at like ducks. Not that it's nice to shoot ducks, but they were being shot at like ducks. Mass um, executions 
of civilians. Um, otherworldly evil. Unspeakable evil. A couple of paragraphs. Shlomit Marciano, um, who is a, a friend of um, uh, a young woman by the surname Agamani, who was taken to Gaza by, the, by Hamas. Um, Shlomit, um, Agamani's closest childhood friend, was on the phone to me, Ruth Margalit says. She was sitting in Agamani's parents' house in the south-central city of Beersheba. She was speaking of her friend with a giant heart, who will be 26 next week. Uh, when I heard, Ruth writes, um, a man weeping in the background, God help me, God help me. Marciano apologized to me and explained that this was Agamani's father, Yako. He had just watched the video of his daughter being taken into Gaza, she said. On Sunday, Yakov spoke to reporters. He said, enough with the wars, enough with everything we're seeing, he pleaded in a faint voice. Then he detailed the cost to the other side. They have also lost loved ones in the war. They also have captives. They also have mourning mothers. Let's engage our emotions. We are two nations from the same father. Let's please make peace, real peace, he said, his voice breaking. So now I'm going to react to some of the horrific pro Hamas texts. So this is a, a take I would call disgraceful from an academic at a university in, in, in the UK of the younger generation on Twitter. I won't give the name. And I've been asked repeatedly to react to this and I will. Sometimes partying on stolen land next to a concentration camp where a million people are starved has consequences. So, I agree the situation in Gaza is bad and that Gaza is a kind of a giant co co colonial prison. Um, but this is obviously a disgraceful um, statement. So let me analyze it in terms of appropriateness. So I would be happy to evict somebody for saying that in many situations in life. I could imagine evicting them if they said that on my YouTube channels. But um, there is one context in which I would take a very different view, and that is a professional academic context. And in the professional academic context, if somebody said these kids had it coming when they were dancing and enjoying, um, that would be permissible speech. And if it would be speech that I would find completely disgraceful and despicable, but it would be permitted. So if in an academic context that boy, the academic boy said that, and We've terribly run out of over time. I'm so sorry. But if th this boy said that in the academic context I'm in, and, and the boy got evicted from the room, I would leave and protest at his eviction. He has, um, as part of the elementary commitments to, print, to, to, to free speech that must be available at the universities, right? If you lose that at universities, you lose them as a basic counter-majoritarian democratic institution and universities are virtually as important as the other counter majoritarian institutions right so kicking this disgraceful boy out would be a disgraceful attack in of itself on our democracy now in other contexts i might myself want to evict him in that context uh, I, I would protest at his eviction so that's what i would say now final question about connecting this all to ukraine Um, uh, 
this requires a big analysis. So let me just make one remark for now. This could be a separate video. Um, the last couple of days have been the worst state of social media I've ever seen. Not just how the algorithms have failed, particularly on Twitter, and failed is the wrong word that bugs the feature, but how many people came up with bad takes and what's happened to a lot of the pro-Ukraine folks, of which at least at the level of my position I'm one, um, is that they have tried to take what I call an exploitative position on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which is a position that best props up their position on Ukraine, as though their position on Ukraine isn't a commitment to um, the interests of their country and a commitment to the people of Ukraine, but some kind of commercial investment, which then dictates how you think about other investments you might make. No. So don't do that. Do not arrange your view um, of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, wherever you, wherever you land on it, right? Um, do not arrange it in, in such a way as to make it a prop that most conveniently elevates your position on, on um, Putin's brutal invasion of Ukraine. Don't do that. Make your view separate. Um, so, so what I've done today is given you a kind of um, emotional temperature um, that you can do what you want with. Do not adopt my views on this. Do not adopt my views. Adopt and explore your views. But I've given you a bit of a kind of an, um, an ethical um, set of um, tips and suggestions about balancing everything. Because I know the biggest issue here is not analysis for most people in this community, but oh my God, this is despicable, uh, uh, inconceivable evil that we've witnessed, the execution of um, innocent civilians. Um, but on the other hand, we, we're very troubled by Israel's um, conduct over the years. How do we balance all of this, right? That's the problem that I'm speaking to. Um, small announcement. I just had a chat just before the Hamas attack, so we don't discuss it, with one of my favorite YouTube channels, Adam Ragusia. And um, I'll, I'll link that up uh, below. We discuss Ukraine and the ethics of being a public intellectual and a couple of other topics. And I'm also going to link um, Ruth Margalit's article about the music festival massacre, um, which is, I think, a, a free access article in the New Yorker. Lots of love. Talk soon.